Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. I'm Uloma Agba, the Lead Gender Specialist for the United Nations Capital Development Fund's Migration and Remittances Program, and I'm thrilled to be your moderator today. So today's discussion is going to be engaging and informative as we explore the crucial role of gender in remittances within the context of South-South migration in Africa. But before we get started, we'd like to launch a short poll and would ask everyone in the audience to kindly participate. Um, it will only take us about five minutes. So the questions are really designed to gaze the, gauge the audience understanding of um, the status of migrant women across the globe. And so hopefully you can all see the, the poll and complete it. So we'll give about one more minute and then we will close the poll. I see we have about 70% of the participants have answered the poll. Hopefully we can get to 90 or 100 in the next 60 seconds or so. All right, in the interest of time, we will move to close the poll, so. Perfect, so the, quest the first question was on what percentage of remittances sent to the Global South are from migrant women? And the correct answer is 55%. And so in reality, of the 282 million migrants around the world, um, half of them are women. And in most contexts, um, on the receiving end of remittances, um, women account for up to 60 to 70 percent of remittance recipients. So you can see that women do have a key role to play both on the sending and receiving side of remittances. And the second question was around what region of the world do migrant women make up the highest proportion of remittance centers? And the correct answer here is Sub-Saharan Africa. And indeed, our conversation today will be really looking at the gendered experience, both of migrant women and um, recipient women um, in the context of Africa. And lastly, um, we asked what the relationship, what you think the relationship between gender and the amount of remittances sent by migrant workers. And again, here, the correct answer is that migrant women migrant workers tend to send a larger proportion of their income than men. So even in most cases where migrant women um, in general tend to make less than migrant men, they do end up sending a greater proportion of their income and tend to do so more frequently. So the topic we're discussing today is important because the financial inclusion of the 140 million migrant women is essential to the global development discourse. Remittances from these migrant women are not only a vital source of income for millions of households in low and middle income countries, but are also pivotal 
for the financial inclusion and resilience of the families on the receiving end. And despite the strong presence of women, both on the sending and receiving side of remittances, there's a common assumption that remittance patterns are gender neutral. However, this is far from the truth. Gender plays a significant role in remittances from who migrates to how remittances are used and what financial resilience opportunities are created and leveraged as a result. Um, next slide, please. To address this issue, UNCDF's three-pronged approach to mainstreaming gender and remittances includes empowering the public and private sector with data and evidence to make informed decisions on remittance policy and innovation. Mainstreaming gender across and through our four work streams, which include enabling policy and regulation, open digital payment ecosystems, inclusive innovation, and empowered customers. And lastly, collaborating with a range of stakeholders to advocate for and disseminate gender smart and migrant centric insights. Now, over the last two years, UNCDF has partnered with a range of remittance and financial service providers to apply a gender lens in remittance innovation. We've already uncovered key gender insights that can be leveraged to inform gender smart and migrant centric innovations and have directly reached over 150,000 women customers so far. Um, next slide, please. Now, in line with our collaboration pillar, UNCDF has set up the Gender Collaborative for Remittances, also called the Gender CoLab, to drive scalable sector-wide impact and gender transformative outcomes in financial inclusion and resilience for migrants and their families, especially migrant women and women recipients. These gender collab sessions, including today's discussion, will gather research partners, industry leaders, policymakers, and practitioners to explore the latest trends in the remittance sector with a gender perspective. Um, next slide. So shortly, we'll delve into the unique aspects of South-South migration from an African perspective. Now, unlike South-North migration, South-South migration has different drivers, experiences, and economic impacts on remittances. And understanding the gendered experiences within South-South migration and remittances is critical for women's economic empowerment. However, opportunities to convene at the global level and share these insights are limited, which is why we're really excited to be hosting this conversation today. And today we'll be exploring the experiences of migrant women and women recipients in Africa, as I said earlier, gaining a deeper understanding of their needs as a customer group. We'll discuss the determinants of South-South migration within and from African countries, the socioeconomic dimensions, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on remittance trends associated with South-South migration. To facilitate the discussion, we will have the opportunity to listen to our three guest speakers, and after their presentations, we will proceed to the Q&A session where we will address questions from the audience. So we kindly invite you to share your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them during the session. With that, it is my great pleasure to introduce our esteemed guests. First, we have Kaleo Nakazwe. Kaleo is a product manager building Flutter Waves Remittance Products Send. She's worked in the financial sector for several years, focusing on product growth, business development, and has built a career creating new fintech products to solve problems in emerging markets. Kaleo and her team at Flutterwave have created simple and easy to use cross-border money transfer solutions to help families receive money from abroad without having to pay large fees or deal with complicated systems. She works on the go-to-market strategy for the Send product and works across cross-functional teams to ensure the product vision is aligned with the company's overall strategy. Welcome, Kalea. Thank you, Ilona. Up second to present will be Sharon Wheelang. Sharon is the Director for Network Expansion at MFS Africa. In this role, she is responsible for expanding MFS Africa's footprint and growing the suite of services offered. She's a founding employee at MFS Africa and has held various roles within the company since its inception in 2010. 
Prior to MFS Africa, Sharon was at MTN Cameroon, where she was part of the team that launched MTN's mobile money service in the country. Sharon also worked as an inventory auditor at Walmart Corporation and a valuation analyst at Standard Chartered Bank. She holds an MBA from American University in Washington, DC, and a Bachelor of Science in Accounting from Purdue University. And Sharon speaks fluent English and French. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. Thank you. And our third and final presenter today will be Babette Lind. Babette serves as the Chief Marketing Officer at Ping Money and is responsible for formulating and implementing the FinTech company's marketing strategy. Her expertise lies in brand positioning, messaging, and devising effective go-to-market plans for new offerings. Babette has a strong passion for promoting sustainable development and financial inclusion. She's also an alumnus of the Tony Elumelu Foundation Entrepreneurship Program, where she presented a groundbreaking proposal to tackle light poverty in rural Gambia by providing off-grid solar solutions. As an experienced business manager, she has a proven track record of implementing initiatives that promote inclusion, increase diversity, and welcome and drive positive change. Welcome, Babette. Thank you, Loma. So I'd now like to turn the floor over to our speakers, starting with Kalea. All right, thank you, Oloma. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so I would like to give everyone just a perspective of where we are in Africa when it comes to remittance. When you actually look at the numbers, you might think a lot of people are actually leaving Africa to go into Europe or the US or Asia. However, when you look at the numbers, 21 million of most of the migrants in Africa are actually migrating within Africa. Uh, when you look at the top countries, uh, that would be Egypt, Morocco, Sudan, uh, and Somalia, you find that a lot of these immigrants are moving from one country to the other, with the highest uh, region being North Africa. And then we've got West Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, um, and then followed by Central Africa. But I think what is important for us to understand and to know is that at least 21 million are migrating within Africa, which really represents 50% and a great opportunity for remittance companies to actually be able to create products uh, that would be able to assist and support most of these migrants that are actually moving within Africa. Next slide, please. So just to give you a perspective, it is estimated that at least 86 million uh, migrants will be within Africa, which is very interesting because a lot of currently we are at 21 uh, million. So 86 million means that there's a lot of us, there's a lot of work for us to be able to do, for us to be able to make sure that remittances and remittance products within Africa are actually making sense. And so when you look at the regions, as I mentioned earlier, you can be able to see that West Africa actually leads when it comes to these uh, countries where a lot of um, Africans are migrating to. And then we've got again, North Africa here, uh, Southern Africa and Central Africa. So West Africa is represented by at least 10.5 million migrants that are moving within West Africa. But when you look at the next slide that actually explains and shows that when it comes to the cost of sending money within these regions, West Africa is actually very expensive. Uh, these are the top countries. When you look at uh, intra-Africa remittance, these are the top countries where uh, a lot of uh, migrants are actually sending money, moving money and sending money to. So we've got Cameroon with at least 2.5 billion in volume. But when you look at the cost of being able to send money from Cameroon to Nigeria, it's about 16.2%. And when we look at the average cost of sending money within Africa, we're looking at 9% for every $200 that is sent. 
currently the World Bank's goal is for us to be able to hit and reach the 3% mark. But when you look at just the average uh, cost of sending money and the top countries and corridors that are meant to be where a lot of migrants are moving to, they're actually one of the highest when it comes to the cost of sending money, with the exception of sending money from Nigeria to Ghana, which is about 4.3% uh, or 4.37%. Some of the key observations is that most of these regions and most of these African countries are actually using different payment options and different channels when it comes to remittance. That would include your cash pickup, your, um, your different uh, mobile money uh, accounts, your bank accounts, all the different types of remittance. However, due to the cost of being able to send money a lot of these migrants are actually looking for the alternative. What is the alternative that we can be able to use to send money um, within these corridors? We can move to the next slide. So now when we dwell into uh, what is happening when it comes and what is unique with South to South migration in Africa that affects how remittances are accessed and used one of the things that we actually need to understand and learn and know is that a lot of migration that is happening, for instance, within Africa is mostly informal. A lot of uh, women that are migrating, a lot of other um, men that are migrating are all in the informal sector. However, 89% of those uh, women that are actually migrating to become domestic workers. So a lot, we are looking at informal sector that is covering both domestic and trade um, and not really looking at the professional industry. So this really speaks a lot to the type of uh, customers and migrants that we're looking at when we speak of remittance within the South to South region with a perspective uh, of being in Africa. The other thing that, stands out and still remains unique is the nomadic like uh, migration where a lot of migrants are moving from one country to the other not as the first stepping uh, not as a place for them to be able to settle but a stepping stone for them to be able to move to a different country and the reason for this there's so many factors that are really leading to this and one of them being able to access um, affordable financial services um, as you can see, the cost, just looking at the right graph, the cost of sending money to some of these countries or from some of these countries, we're looking at 27% for Tanzania, which is quite high if you're looking at most of them being in the informal sector and not being able to make enough money to be able to send um, money back home. So when we actually do look at the high cost of of being able to send money, what this actually leads to, um, I did mention it earlier, but just to uh, say it again, is that it leads to channels, informal channels or alternative channels uh, that makes it almost difficult for remittance companies to stay competitive. And then, and if we're looking at um, remittance companies trying to be able to compete in this space, we need to start looking at what are some of the options and what are some of the alternatives. Um, that we should be uh, solutions that we should be providing to be able to cover the cost of remittance. Currently, we are competing with channels like Hawala, where you know uh, immigrants are able to send money through channels where they could either know someone who's willing to exchange the the current uh, currency that they might have. And so ideally we're trying to make sure that everyone is financially included. So how do we make it easier for them to be able to send money through our platforms um, and be able to achieve the goal of either sending money for education purposes or for healthcare purposes or for whatever purposes they might be trying to send, um, even being able to save money and just um, not really trying to make sure that the money leaves the, the ecosystem. Next slide, please. And so really when we actually look um, and dwell into women experiences, one of the things that we actually see is that these women are, might be illegal immigrants and might not, be have the right, might not be able to have the right identification. So what does this mean? 
This really means that even when we're creating different solutions for these women, we should be looking at being able to take into consideration the type of clientele that we are serving. 89% of women in sub-Saharan are in informal work uh, sectors, of which 73% are domestic workers. So what that means is that when they are going to come on your platform, they might not have a full uh, knowledge of how they should be able to sign up on the platform, or they might not be able to have the full knowledge of what is the right identification. And so for some of the uh, responses that we should be able to be providing is, how do we create a seamless and easy process using different platforms, not just um, mobile applications, but taking into consideration your USSD or your social media, like your WhatsApp in order to be able to help some of these uh, migrant workers. But in addition to that, getting the right ident identification, not just limiting to driver's license or IDs, uh, but then also taking into account maybe asylum um, documentation or any other documentation that actually allows these women to be, uh, to be able to process payments um, on, on any platform. Additionally, because 89% of these are women in Sub-Saharan Africa, what that means is that it can be slightly expensive for them to be able to send money because mostly uh, we saw the poor earlier that um, Oloma shared that most of the, the people that are sending money in large sums are women. And really they're sending them for different uh, reasons. They've got families back home. Uh, they're paying for education. They're supporting all the uh, different family members or extended family. So how do we then make sure that we can be able to provide that support where they don't have to constantly send money and money is misused, but they can be able to uh, directly pay for some of these solutions. They can directly pay for education or healthcare. They can be able to directly pay uh, for the different support that they're providing uh, for the families back home. Uh, in addition to the above, um, some of the other experiences that most women are actually facing is that uh, we actually identify that most of them, when they move into these corridors and when they move into these countries, what they are actually looking at and most of the business that they have besides domestic, being domestic workers is that they are in trading where they are buying and selling um, different products, different maybe clothing and all the different items that you know, they want to be able to, um, to sell so that they can be able to earn money. So then it comes back to the uh, remittance providers to say, what are some of the solutions that we can be providing to traders that would then be able to allow them to have an end-to-end -end solution that enables them to sell their products, but at the same time, they can be able to, through the same platform, be able to sell those, send money back home through uh, their wallets or through their accounts after they've been able to sell. We, for, so for, for Flutterweb, what we actually have is that in most of the countries where we are operating, I think it's very important for us to have um, on the ground presence because ideally for most of these um, migrants and women entrepreneurs and, and women migrants as well, there's a lot of support that is needed to just really show them and help them to get on some of these platforms. And so it is very important to have on the ground support that is then able to really help um, and be able to get most of these women financially included. It is also very important, um, as I mentioned earlier, to be able to look at the different options when it comes to what are the payment methods? If they send money back home, would they be able to access this payment? And so this is where a lot of partnership comes in, a lot of integration, being able to identify the different partners to work with in the different regions. Because at that level, um, you can be able to provide as many options and as many solutions for these um, women who are sending money back home, including your, uh, your cash pickup, uh, being able to create profiles on on the different um, payment platforms that currently exist, of which a lot of them are actually there. We can move to the next slide. Uh, 
And so to really just uh, summarize uh, the conversation, when you look at the slide, uh, the graph on the, on the right, it really shows you the performance of uh, migrants during uh, the COVID pandemic. Most of them, as mentioned earlier, work uh, in the informal and um, are in the informal sector. So looking at domestic workers and looking at those that are in trading. And so we're able to see that those are the ones that were actually affected. At least 34% um, lost their all the opportunities that they had, whether they were domestic workers or they were actually selling and buying um, different products uh, for them to be able to send, uh, to get money or gain income to send back home. At least 26% of the women that were domestic workers lost their jobs. Um, and we're looking at at least those that really had low income with other different uh, job opportunities, 30% of those lost their jobs. So we're looking at 39% and 34%, which is quite high when you look at uh, being able to support women even during these times. So one of the trends that we have actually been able to see after the pandemic is that a lot of these women migrants have actually become more accustomed when you look at the digital solutions that are being provided. Um, and because of this, I think it's very important for us to be able to then identify where the opportunities are. A lot of them, uh, moving from one country to the other, how do we create profiles for them that allows them to, to maintain one account so that that account is the one they would use if they move from South Africa um, and they go to um, Ghana and they go to a different region? How do we create that interoperability? I think this is very important when it comes to how we can be able to adapt to some of these new trends so that we can then begin to embrace um, the 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 digital solutions and um, the digital knowledge that most of the informal migrants have then been able to acquire during these times. Another thing that is very, very important is to constantly create uh, options and solutions when it comes to creating education um, opportunities for them uh, in be being able to understand how they can then be able to further utilize uh, the different payment platforms and payment solutions. Uh, being able to adjust and make changes to products that then uh, take into account not just one language, but then you can be able to take into account your French um, and all these other local languages um, on one application. Also looking at constant uh, integration when it comes to all the other solutions that most of these migrants are looking at. Most of them, as mentioned earlier, are looking at the healthcare, sending money for education purposes, for others maybe trying to build, um, trying to create savings, and also trying to see where they could be able to invest. So then being able to integrate end-to-end -end solutions for them on one platform, I think is really key to, to taking advantage of the current trends that exist. Paloma, thank you. And over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Kalia. That was great. I think it was really interesting to see those statistics on, you know, where women are represented um, in terms of migration, South-South migration across Africa. Um, you know, that stat of 89% of women, uh, migrant women across Africa are in the informal sector, and 73% of them are domestic workers. Um, and, you know, really this idea that, um, you know, there could be some of them that are irregular, so meaning that they may not have come through these formal channels, but, you know, somehow they've made their way to, to another country and they might not always have the legal documentation to be there or to work or to access um, some of these financial services. So I think with that, we will move over to our next um, presenter, um, Sharon. Um, so over to you, Sharon. Okay. Thank you, Uluma and Kaleo. Um, great job. I think you have most of the talking points when you were doing the presentation. I'm like, okay, um, what I'll try to do, I don't have a presentation set, but I'll try to complement uh, what Kaleo has done uh, so that we're not duplicating efforts. And then it might give us more time for, for the discussions and questions. Um, from my perspective, what is unique to South to South migration in, Af in Africa and how are remittances accessed and used? Uh, like Alio said, the majority of 
diaspora in Africa is really within Africa. So we're seeing more Africans are migrating within Africa than Africans are migrating, say, to Europe, US, or Asia, and the, and the majority of them, obviously, are in African countries. Um, most of these migrants are usually younger. Uh, they're entrepreneurs, they're merchants or traders, skilled workers uh, who are moving to countries that probably have easier access to visas or no visas at all. And the goal is usually to provide a better life for their families. Uh, most of the migrants also move solo uh, to begin with. Uh, I'm sitting out of Cameroon and when I look at most of the migrants that are here, most of them first come without their families. Uh, they travel front and back and then eventually move their families when they are financially stable. And as you know, with such trends, obviously comes remittance and trades kind of follow uh, migration because when you have people that are migrating uh, for a better life, uh, what you eventually see is the remittance will kind of flow in that direction. And some data, uh, and Kalia has given a lot of that, but just adding to what she's given, about 40% of the remittances that we see in Africa is really coming within Africa. Uh, so it's about, we are looking at more than 30 billion uh, transferred just within Africa. Again, when you take uh, the Cameroon Nigerian corridor, for example, which is the largest remittance corridor uh, in, in, in Africa, you mostly see traders, uh, merchants, and they're responsible for about 80% of the funds that is, tra is transferred uh, between both countries, estimating about 2.5 billion a year. Uh, we see the same trend, uh, especially at MFS Africa. Uh, Really within, uh, Kalio was straight up to the point, the biggest of this we see in West Africa, uh, a lot of it can be credited to the fact that you have the ECOWAS where there's free movement uh, between the countries. We see a lot of remittances that flow between Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, or between Togo and Benin, just to name a few. We also have, we we'll say, the highly skilled workers that are moving to other countries. You say uh, the more developed within the developing countries, say South Africa, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, for example, has become a big hub now for, for skilled workers in Anglophone, in Francophone Africa that are looking for, for a better life and obviously and better paying jobs. Uh, so you have those cities now that have become melting points for skilled workers. Now, despite this opportunity uh, that we've heard, uh, Africa is still the most expensive in the region uh, to send money. And this remittance super tax is even stronger for inter-African corridors. Uh, like we had in the previous conversation, West Africa being the most expensive uh, at averaging about 16% of uh, the cost, whether it's because it's through informal channels uh, making it more pricey. Uh, we'll discuss that further. But again, very expensive. And we believe that most of it is, is driven by the lack of formal solutions uh, that are not necessarily accessible or instant. We do have the arrival and the adoption of mobile money that has been a big key in driving financial inclusions and creating some kind of formal solutions as we see an uptake in mobile money remittances. And obviously here at MFS Africa, about a decade ago, we started uh, enabling digital cross-border remittances across uh, the first corridor that we had, for example, was Cote d'Ivoire, MTN, Cote d'Ivoire and Benin. Uh, which started very timidly, but quickly, obviously, as word got out that uh, this was possibly was cheaper than what people were used to, uh, that quickly took off. Now, uh, if we have to narrow this down to the experience from women in the South-South remittance from a sending and receiving point of view, and how are some RSPs responding or supporting women, uh, in terms of financial inclusion. I have to say, um, I'm going to look at this on the other side, uh, since we've heard a lot on the sending side. If we look at the receiving side, it's a bit paradoxical because the, the impression that we have obviously is that if you have a partner or a spouse that is migrating, uh, your life is supposed to be better, but what that ends up doing is that it puts some kind of strain on the partner that is left behind. Uh, that overnight become, becomes a breadwinner and they kind of have to close financial gaps that have been created uh, because the breadwinner has moved 
to migrate to another country for, for, for greener pastures, if you will. So you find that uh, mostly women on the receiving end of things, uh, they now have to kind of get side jobs or, or training, some kind of training, or even some of the money that they receive, they will start some side hustles to see how they can close the gap in the new roles that they are, they are the new hats that they are now wearing. So uh, having believed in that women are the main recipients of remittance, we also know that migrant women typically earn less than uh, the men and migrant workers, occup the occupations is, co is, is different. I mean, I talked about traders, and merchants uh, in the in the previous uh, question, but when you look at this, the question is that are women also part of the traders and the merchant, or is it mostly men? So, as an industry, we do need good quality sex delegated data on remittances, uh, without which it's a bit hard for the private sector, I have to say, to come up with solutions and that support migrant women's financial inclusion or digitalizing the sector to help in reducing the cost. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, when Oloma was going through all the data, I was, I was like, wow, I didn't know most of, uh, most of that around women. So I wish those are things that have that, that are made more accessible uh, to people, especially those of us that are in the position to finding uh, solutions. Obviously, one of the challenges that was mentioned before in digitalizing remittances, especially for, for migrants, women, is identification. Uh, most of it can be due to illegal immigration or just lack of proper documentation, depending on where these people are. In our experience, we find that uh, people in rural areas usually even uh, usually have challenges in uh, documentation, whether or not they're migrants. Uh, so there's something to be said in how does the government step in uh, to help with these KYC challenges? Because until we sort this out, even trying to digitalizing or formalizing the sector, we keep being a it will keep being a challenge. Uh, at MFS, we obviously believe that financial inclusion is very important in how we navigate the different challenges that uh, people, the migrants, women are facing. And we do have some organizations that are doing a great job in training women. Uh, last year, we partnered with IEFAD uh, to grant access across 14 corridors. Uh, we have Africa, Gambia, Orange, Senegal, just to name a with the goal being to promote some financial literacy and empower women. And obviously, since we launched these programs, we are, we are, we are closely monitoring the optic uh, to, of remittances to see as we educate these women, uh, as we help with the identification and financial literacy, how does that impact their ability to send, uh, to send money to their loved ones? Uh, since the pandemic, uh, it's been very interesting. We have to say the pandemic actually brought a shift from cash to digital in a tandem that was equivalent to the rise in the adoption and the usage of mobile money across Africa. Uh, at MFS, for example, we saw firsthand an accelerated shift uh, to digital remittances that were processing we had record uh, value of payments that we're doing. And obviously it's because everybody was trying to move from cash uh, to digital. And since, the, since COVID, I don't want to say it's ended, since things have started going back to normal, the trend hasn't changed. Uh, we also saw a rise in interoperability amongst remittance players uh, with the big traditional remittance players that we know, like the World Remit, uh, MoneyGram and, and, and such reaching out to the likes of Flutterwave, to the likes of MFS, uh, to see how they could integrate into our platforms to be able to terminate uh, to mobile wallet, given the challenges that they were having uh, with uh, obviously face-to-face -face over-the-counter transactions. And again, like I said, these are, these are trends that hasn't changed. There was also a huge jump in e-commerce uh, as stores were closing down. Uh, we had a lot of our, our partners reach out to us and say, hey, a lot of our clients are asking to add mobile money as a means of payments, uh, to be able to receive payments from a distance, knowing that a lot of these people are unbanked. How do we do that? So even from a use case, we left from remittance being the hotcake to uh, merchant payments and e-commerce being 
the next uh, big thing in the light of, and now everybody's trying to see how do we get this unbanked onto our platform and accept or trade with them. And even as we're talking about migration, how do you do cross-border trade uh, but not from a remittance point of view, because as we know, remittance and the pricing for when you're collecting uh, funds for trade is completely different. So we do have that uptake as well. And then you have even the likes of Visa uh, that we, we recently partnered with that they are also trying to add as a means of topping up the vi virtual visa cards uh, options for people to use for e-commerce. Uh, obviously, with interoperability and growth in merchant payments, uh, we saw a drop in prices. Uh, because the market became very competitive uh, and it also became a bit formal. Uh, so as MNOs work with governments and try to formalize these channels, as you have more MFS and flutter waves of the world uh, and pings of the world, you will see that the, there's a drop in prices. Uh, I don't know how much, I wish I had data for how the drop had been from uh, pre and post COVID, uh, but we're seeing that. And obviously, at MFS, we believe uh, in making borders matter less. And the pandemic was really a catalyst for others to join the movement. And the industry has been moving in the right direction since. So that's that's all for me, uh, Oloma. No, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, I think also some really interesting uh, points that you raised um, that, um, you know, the really pointing out that 40% of the remittances, you know, in, in Africa are from within the region rather than flowing into from either from the north or from, from other places. And also, you know, I think, and we'll see that coming up in the Q&A, we're already getting some questions in, you know, really looking at the issues while, while COVID-19 may have accelerated that shift um, from cash to digital, we're seeing that women are still stuck with that same, the same issues that they've had in terms of having lower financial literacy, having issues um, with, with KYC, and also again, that their price sensitivity, and you know, even though we have more interoperability that could be driving down prices, is that really reaching, um, are women really reaping the benefits? If it's um, equally. Um, so I think with that, we will hand over to our last and final presenter for the day, Babette, over to you. Thank you so much, Aloma. Um, we don't need to share the slides quite yet because um, they're only a small part of, of the presentation. I'll just speak for now. Um, but um, yeah, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be to be here today and taking part of this discussion. This was there was some really really good insights shared by Sharon and Kaleo. Thank you so much, and um, I'm pleased that you've covered the wider Africa um, with this regard. Um, because I'm going to speak. I'm going to zoom in on the Gambia Sen Senegal corridor, which is. Um, which we're more familiar with and um, work directly within. Um, so I'm not going to be repeating any of what's been said to date, but we'll zoom in on, on um, Gambia, Senegal. So um, first of all, Ping Money is a relatively new um, startup in the remittance space. We started trading end of 2019 and our main corridor to date has been UK to Gambia transfers. We also launched UK to Senegal transfers in late 2020, and we offer Gambia specific bill payment services from anywhere globally. And over the past six months, we've been working on our expansion strategy. So we're looking to launch US uh, to Gambia, Senegal in the coming months. And we have been exploring partnerships, um, some of which are uh, Flutterwave and MFS actually. Um, as we're developing a remittance wallet, wallet that will offer intra-Africa remittance services. So when we look at the Gambia-Senegal corridor, you'll find that it's a unique one in many ways. Um, I framed my thinking around Ping's experience as a market player, the sender-receiver perspective, and the data. So I'll share my thoughts in three parts. Firstly, I'll start by outlining what the transfer trends are, the migration patterns, and also look at the specific customer profiles. Secondly, I'll talk about the gender aspect and what I understand about women's experience of sending receiving in this corridor. And thirdly, I'll touch on the impact that the pandemic has had, the trends that have emerged and how we are adjusting accordingly. So for the first part, the data. 
Let me start by highlighting how reliant the Gambian economy is on remittances. If we look at the official 2020 figures, they show that remittances make up about 26% of GDP. However, according to the Central Bank of the Gambia, this jumped to 60% in 2021, which is immensely significant. I don't have the official data on that, but this is according to Central Bank. The average cost of sending to the Gambia is about 12%. Again, something that Kaleo touched on, it is uh, one of the highest for this region. And uh, for Senegal, remittances, excuse me, account for about 9.6% of GDP, and the average cost of sending is about 4.6. So when comparing the two countries, there is a difference. And this is where some of the data becomes interesting. So can we go to slide two, please? Are we on slide two? Okay, okay. So in 2020, the total remittance inflow into the Gambia was $579 million. In that same year, the outflow from Gambia to Senegal was 326 million. That's the equivalent of more than 50% of the total amount coming into the Gambia globally that is basically going out specifically into Senegal. I just have to stress that I am using 2020 data to illustrate the inflows and outflows here because um, these are the most recent official numbers that I could get my hands on when it comes to the flow between Gambia to Senegal. But the inflows to Gambia have actually increased in 2021 by about 30% to 773 million. That's a huge jump. And in 2022, we saw similar numbers. So I just wanted to mention that as a side note, and we will come back to that when we look at the remittance trends during the pandemic. So let's take a look at the next slide, please. So here we're looking at the intra-Africa only inflows and outflows for Senegal and Gambia over time from 2010 onwards. On the right, you see Senegal inflows in blue, very high. And the complete opposite picture, when you look at the Gambia, where outflows in orange are very high and inflows low. So you've got a complete mirror opposite there. So if we just think about this for a moment, in this heavily remittance-dependent country, Gambia, you have 326 million being sent to Senegal. And what I know about the flow in the other direction from Senegal to Gambia in the same year, it was only around 11 million. Obviously, this does not include the formal, the informal cash flows between the countries. Can you have the next slide, please? On the right chart here, you see that Senegal has, um, which explains some of this flow of money, 21% of the, the diaspora is in Gambia. It's just a little bit more than those living in France, quite a bit. And on the chart on the left, you see that the top two incoming remittance flow countries are from France, Italy, but then Gambia is not far behind in third place. Thank you, you can stop sharing now. So I wanted to link these inflows and outflows and I'm not sure it's quite Q&A time yet, but <laughs> I'll continue speaking. So if I link these inflows and outflows to real life, um, to a real life example, to just help you put the activity into further context. So I personally send about 200 pounds from the UK on a monthly basis to my aunt in the Gambia for her and her family. 20% about that, or of that goes to education costs. About 30% goes towards utilities and transport, and the remaining 50% she spends on food supplies. She goes to the market for these food supplies, and the fish and the meat and the vegetables that she buys are sold by Senegalese vendors, primarily women. The Senegalese vendors will in turn send any profits made 
back to Senegal for their own family's livelihood. And that money then remains largely in Senegal. So if you want to, you can stop sharing altogether um, the slides. Um, but if we now look at the migration pattern and customer profiles that the data relates to, just wanted to mention a little bit about the history between the two countries. It's very intertwined. It goes back generations predating colonialism when these countries were and still are one people made up of the same tribes, the same customs, same languages, same traditions, and so on. And over time, only differentiated by French influences in Senegal and British influences in the Gambia. So the relationship between the countries goes deep and is very strong. And for the Senegalese, Gambia has for a long time been considered a place that offers work opportunities. But there's also a large proportion of Senegalese refugees, whole families that have fled the conflicts in Casamas, which is the southern part of uh, Senegal. Parts of the Senegalese com uh, community that live and work in the Gambia is a combination of family ties and work-related migration. It is very easy to move between borders. So you'll even have some people that commute on a daily basis and those that live in Gambia with extended family for longer periods to work and save, send money back, and then spend a shorter time in Senegal with their core family. Another observation between migrants of these two countries is that whilst the Senegalese are quite entrepreneurial, hardworking, they don't shy away from sort of getting their hands dirty and basically taking up any form of work that will generate income. For them, not only do they see it as a win-win to go to Gambia for work, after all, it's close to home, you most likely have some family there, it's been done by generations, there are work opportunities. But when you then examine the typical Gambian migrants, they typically strongly feel and believe that opportunities are mainly found in Europe or the West. And data shows us that the largest Gambian diaspora communities are found in the US, Spain, Italy, Germany, UK, Scandinavia, et cetera. And another little fact is that they, well, another, Something we know is that there is a general sense that for Gambians, an office job is more highly regarded than any form of trade work um, for those uh, living in the Gambia. So this brings me to the second part of what I want to talk about, which is what we understand about the female senders perspective and how we as a remittance provider can better support them. When it comes to gender, Men tend to do most of the skilled trade jobs. So I'm talking about the Senegalese migrants. The majority of tradesmen in the Gambia are Senegalese. You'll have carpenters, fishermen, masons, builders, welders, tilers, roofers, mechanics, tailors, and so on. And then the women, the majority tend to work at the markets, selling goods or food or as street vendors, also going door to door at offices, selling goods, snacks, lunches, and so on. If we look at why and how much they send, well, primarily it's to provide for their families and send very regularly, monthly, weekly, or daily. We know that men tend to send larger sums than women. And the women that are sending smaller amounts to family also tend to send for SUSU, which are these informal savings collectives. Both men and women also send to pay for goods, something that Sharon also touched on. And they then have those goods sent to them in Gambia for resale. And we've also seen that some are using their Senegalese mobile wallets to save money that they then can use once they're back in Senegal. How they're sending is that at the moment, a large majority of senders are you using WAVE. WAVE uh, recently entered the Gambian market. Their sending fee between Gambia and Senegal is around the 7% mark, which in my opinion is quite high. And whilst we look at their agent commission, this is around 0.35%. People also send using FX bureaus or as mentioned by Kaleo and Sharon, informal channels. 
some of the main sort of pain points that we've picked up on is that in this corridor, corridor, customers are struggling to access efficient ways to receive money into the Gambia from Senegal. The majority are using their wave accounts to send, but they can't use the same provider or the same service to receive. So they're having to resort to informal channels, such as cash being moved across the border, uh, or you can you will see people that know someone with a Senegalese wave account on the ground, transfer from their wave account, from their own wave account to that person's wave account, and then that person will give them the cash in Gambia and Dallasi. We've also noticed that some uh, women senders will struggle sometimes with the tech and will need hands-on support. And this is either because they're IT or financially illiterate and will sometimes have a hard time understanding how much a transfer is actually costing them. Uh, specifically, this happens when the fees are embedded within the overall transfer sum. And now for the final part, I'll touch on the impacts that the pandemic has had uh, on the trends and the trends that have emerged and how paying money is adjusting or should adjust to these trends. So firstly, I think we all agree that, that digital financial services have played an increasingly important role in facilitating remittance flows during the pandemic because many had no choice but to turn to online and mobile services to send and receive money. Of course, some families have experienced a decline in the amount of money they have received. And in some cases, women across both Senegal and Gambia would have been disproportionately affected because they work in industries that have been heavily impacted by the pandemic. So for example, hospitality or tourism. However, as I mentioned earlier, in Gambia, we saw a sharp increase in the amount of formal remittance inflows that I mentioned earlier, which is around 30% of a jump between 2020 to 2021, and that same trend in 2022. And not surprisingly, um, there were reports that of a decline in informal remittances, which can be explained by travel bans and so on. So those that relied on informal channels had to turn to formal ones. The sending flows between Gambia and Senegal remained fairly stable, although I haven't been able to attain the official numbers for, 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 those, uh, for the last two years. So for us as a company, the pandemic hit less than into a, a year into our launch. Um, but it wasn't a bad time to launch because formal remittance uh, providers became more in demand. And in terms of our customers, uh, some of which were turning to formal and digital channels for the first time, there was some level of handholding that we perhaps hadn't anticipated, again mentioned by the uh, other speakers, uh, needing a lot more support when it came to, and we, we had to offer, for example, a lot more verbal or visual guides sort of step-by-step -step support when it, came to, when it came to the onboarding process and sometimes even how to make a transfer. But for us, this was a very positive learning curve uh, because it's kind of helped to shape our approach to our customers' uh, experience strategy. And I would say that we've developed a reputation as a caring, responsive, and proactive company, particularly amongst our women senders. And we've had to, we've also resorted to using tools such as WhatsApp, also mentioned by Sharon earlier. And we're finding that we need to adopt this approach with our senders in the Gambia as well. Uh, we're often having to be quite hands-on hands -on with the customer support. So I will just try to sum up all of this and my thoughts on what we need to consider as we launch our remittance wallet in this corridor and how we can adopt a more gender-centric and financially inclusive approach. So we will want to offer a digital product with transparent and competitive pricing that has saving options and a really good support service. We want to pay particular attention to how we can make remittances easier from Senegal to Gambia. 
And I think that remittances in general is a driver for financial inclusion, particularly for the unbanked sector, which in, in Gambia is around 70%. When I go back to the fee transparency aspect, I think this is really important because we have seen this over and over again with our customers. If you are financially illiterate, it's almost impossible to understand what you're being charged when you're sending money, and that is not helpful. And um, as we continue to move forward with digitized solutions in this space, there is something about ensuring that the wallet is really user-friendly and intuitive. There's something about advocating for a more collaborative ecosystem between market players, financial institutions, regulators, and policymakers. There is something around creating stakeholder groups where knowledge sharing around tools and programs and products solutions or initiatives that enable and advance financial literacy can be discussed. And I picked up on something that Sharon mentioned that would be very beneficial around this because financial literacy forms such a big part of financial inclusion. I'm gonna go back to some quick data. According to a FinScope survey that was done a couple of years back, in Gambia, about 99% of the adults felt that they needed more formal, more information about personal finance. 54% of the adults don't go anywhere to access financial in information. And some, 44%, just get information from their family and friends. And when it comes to uh, service, there's something about making women senders feel supported. As a, as a provider, we have all the power in terms of the sending experience and how easy we make it. So digitally, looking at less clicks, simple onboarding, we mentioned KYC, easy access to customer support, and so on. We also know that women want and would benefit from access to saving products. Many are using Susu to save, but... Um, and again, according to the FinScope survey, only 12% actually rely on informal mechanisms like that to save or borrow money. So there's more that can be done there in terms of the offer. And as a remittance provider, we can make sure that the products we offer will include elements that work for women, as well as making sure that their money stretches as far as possible. Thank you for listening. I'll hand over to you, Ulumu. Uh, thank you so much, Babette. Um, I think it was really interesting to to have that deep dive into the Gambia Senegal corridor and really understanding that um, you know for RSPs such as Ping Money that are working across different corridors and across different countries, um, really this idea of having a really tailored and nuanced customer experience strategies and recognizing that it may not you know you may not be able to apply a one size fits all strategy um, to reach all your customers if you are indeed working across different corridors and addressing um, customers that, that have different mindsets, different needs, um, different reasons why they're migrating um, to even if it's just across the border from a Gambia to a Senegal. And that really that idea, I think that you touched on that it goes beyond having the user-friendly products themselves to having this whole enabling ecosystem around the product and really meeting the migrant customers where they're at, um, the remittance customers where they're at, whether it's through WhatsApp or through other informal or non-digital non um, um, means. Um, so I think with that, we will launch into the Q&A se section of, of the, the conversation. Again, thank you to all of our speakers um, for doing such a phenomenal job. Um, I think before I pose the questions to the speakers, I will start off with one simple question or one basic question that was posed and that asked, what exactly is South-South migration? And so, uh, you know, again, apologies for not um, doing that knowledge or setting at the beginning. So really South-South migration is about migration movement between countries largely within the global South. So for example, looking at countries within Africa, Asia, Latin America, and Babette talked about you know, that movement between Gambia and Senegal. So really that's what we're, we're considering as South-South migration. And it is different from North-South migration, um, which is when people move from the global South to the global North. So again, you know, Babette mentioned 
um, while a lot of Senegalese migrants might see the, the value or the economic opportunity in moving to the Gambia, a lot of Gambian migrants, on the other hand, see greater opportunity in moving from the Gambia to countries in Europe. And that would be considered South-North migration. And so South-South migration has been on the rise in recent years, which is why we're having this discussion here today. And it is important to understand the unique determinants, the trends and the experiences of women as a result, so that we um, working in the remittance sector um, can design appropriate solutions um, to better serve or to meet the financial inclusion needs of migrant women and women recipients um, um, within the context of Africa, Asia and Latin America. And so I think with that, um, we will start off with some of the questions that have come in. Um, I think one question which I wanted to pose to all of the speakers is, you know, we've talked a bit about, you know, the different trends, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on remittance trends and really seeing the shift from cash to digital. But in your view, what elements or changes um, among all of the trends that you've seen in recent years do you think will become part of migration within Africa and accordingly the gendered experience of remittance flows um, in the future. So again, we'll start with, with Calais and then move to Sharon and Babette. All right, thank you, Oloma. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and it was great to hear uh, from the other speakers on, on what is really happening within their regions and just to learn from them. So uh, from, from my view, I think one of the changes um, that we are, or the upcoming trends that we're actually seeing is a lot of, I think one of the speakers did mention a lot of competition um, and, the, and that competition is most likely to drive down the pricing, which is very, very important in order to achieve uh, the goal of the 3% um, that has been said by the World Bank. So uh, we do see that to be something that is on the rise, especially after COVID, being able to see more players uh, coming up with the different solutions that are actually targeting the different segments of migrants within some of the different regions. Um, another thing uh, is a lot of collaboration, um, something that has taken slightly longer um, to be effective within our region, but it is something that is really beginning to pick up. Um, and so we do see that a lot of that is really going to happen to provide the right solutions for the migrants um, and for the different users that are currently on the remittance platforms and also stakeholders really coming together. I think there's one question that I saw in the chat to try and see how do we then marry the informal sector with different products that are coming up, such as um, your cryptocurrency that might not require um, a lot of KYC, but actually does uh, provide some sort of formal, um, a, form, a formal service or a, a formal platform where the different informal migrants can then be able to use the platform. So these are some of um, the trends. Another final trend that I can really mention is on the trade um, side. A lot of uh, we're hoping with different collaboration, especially with regulators, we're going to see a more open um, trade system within, within the African region. Uh, and this with this open system, we're hoping that, you know, we'll be able to see a more seamless um, remittance platform or network that actually then be a, a solves not just for women entrepreneurs or or women traders, but also um, at a larger scale, all the migrants that are moving from one country within Africa to the other. I think that the, these are some of the trends that I really think would be key. Um, and these are some of the elements I think we should be looking out for uh, in the next few years. Thanks, Kalea. Um, over to you, Sharon. Okay, um, again, I will just try to add uh, what Kalua said, so I am not being repetitive. I think from a trends point of view, we are seeing more governments are encouraging freedom of movement with relaxed visa laws and trade packs. Uh, the more we see that happening, the more we see Africans are able to migrate um, from one country to another without any constraints. Uh, we know that this is as well the African Union's vision for the company uh, of the continent with the African continental free trade area. 
so right now, even from when we look at the transactions that we process, the biggest remittance corridors remain corridors where they are dealing either in the same currency zones or their visa fees between them. So that is the first trend that was seen that as institutions and the governments encourage uh, free trade, encourage migrations amongst ourselves in the continent, you're also going to see that. Uh, another thing that Kalio touched on that is very important and is what we've seen as well recently is that regulators are becoming part of the conversations. Uh, if you look at a decade back, uh, some of the services that and remittance being part of it, they were not very regulated. Uh, we are seeing the, the regulation engaging now, MNOs engaging uh, aggregators like ourselves, trying to understand, trying to make sure that uh, they are creating regulations that are in, aligned, uh, uh, not necessarily stifled, uh, because in the past that is kind of what we felt like in the industry that the regulator did not quite understand uh, where the, the, the industry was going and we're not having that conversation. So we're seeing a lot of change uh, in that recently and also trying to get ahead of the game with crypto coming up, trying to see how, to, how does that become part of the conversation. Um, thanks, Sharon. And over to you, Babette. Thank you. I'm going to probably, well, a lot of my thoughts on this have been shared by Sharon and Kaleo already. Um, but if we think about the future, what we might, anything to add to that is um, if we think about urbanization, for example, and uh, looking at population movements, urban population has been projected to grow quite significantly in coming years. Um, how this could affect the gendered experience of remittance flows um, might be that you will see more women moving to urban areas um, and sending back to, to rural areas. Um, but again, I'm, I'm talking about this organization and I'm also thinking about there's something around climate change for me, Africa being quite vulnerable to climate change. Um, overall and so we are probably likely to see a lot of movement and migration that is climate change related um, and this might be to some urban urban parts um, which will also affect uh, standing patterns but again I think the key one is around a more the digital space being continuing to transform uh, the, the, the remittance landscape in Gambia, driving prices in Gambia, in Africa and Gambia, driving prices down, um, making the space more competitive and essentially benefiting senders of all sorts. I'll leave that at that. Um, thank you all. Um, a really good good points raised. We've talked about, you know, competition and digital transformation, driving prices down, maybe a reversal in migration and movement trends, the impact of that climate change um, is having and will continue to have um, um, in, in the coming years on migration um, within Africa. Also looking at, you know, regulation catching up to, to the changes that have been, um, that are ongoing, and then also issues of KYC being um, more um, suitably addressed. And so I think that's a good segue to the next question. Um, I see a couple of questions in the chat around financial literacy, so I'm going to try to club them together and address them again to all of the panelists. Um, could you provide examples of women-specific financial literacy tools and initiatives um, that you have seen um, either through your own organizations or others working in the space? Um, because I think the audience is keen to understand um, if there's re really any differentiation taking place between general financial literacy tools and those that are really targeted at women, if indeed this issue of financial literacy is one that is keeping migrant women and, and women recipients on the other end from really taking advantage of the digitization of, of remittances. So again, um, we'll start with you, Kalea. All right, uh, thank you, Oloma. I think one of the tools that we've actually been able to see 
especially on the remittance platform is being able to create um, within the app or within the USSD platform, being able to create uh, solutions that are able to assist or support uh, some of these women entrepreneurs or some of these migrants. An example would be um, your WhatsApp chat where you know uh, customers are able to ask some of these questions to say, okay, how do I send money? Or what, what are some of these issues that currently exist? Or um, how do I create an account? All the different questions that might be there and having different AIs um, that actually do integrate into these platforms, trying to provide answers in, in different languages if possible, whether it's from a USSD. We've also seen, um, and some of the tools that we're using that is voice um, that also tries to help and support some of the questions uh, that some of the, the women migrants might be able to have. But more importantly, being able to collaborate and work with different partners uh, in person, being able to really schedule whether it's workshops or webinars or um, interactions, you know, within communities or groups where these women can be found or where these migrants can be found and being able to provide um, different information on the different issues that are surrounding all the financial solutions um, that lead to financial inclusion. Thanks, Kalea. Um, over to you, Sharon. Okay, thanks, uh, Uluma. So I think I, I mentioned uh, earlier that we, we, in partnership with eFund, has a grant where the focus is to fund where we are funding literacy uh, programs around with MNUs. Uh, so I'm just going to do, I will talk about what we've done in Gambia, uh, Bebet, and you'll be happy about that. Uh, so in Gambia, with Afri Money, uh, we identified some women who participate in saving schemes such like Tontins or Susu in rural areas so that they can become anchor women. Uh, we organized a two-day training on digital financial services uh, in, with Afri Money and ourselves. And the goal, obviously, of this training was for them to become agents at the end of it. And as agents, you know, they can register, they can educate other members of their community, other members of their tontines on mobile money services and while ending a commission or ending a living from this. <clears throat> we also try to see how can they digitalize their savings uh, and capitalize on the whole mobile money ecosystem, including obviously receiving remittances from out uh, directly into their wallet. So this is just a highlight of, of many such programs that are out there, but just what we've done specifically uh, this quarter with AfriMoney in Gambia. Um, thanks, Sharon. And then over to you, Babette. Sorry, he's on me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. That's, uh, that's it right there. <laughs> <laughs> um, for, for, for Gambia. So, I think, as I mentioned when I was presenting, um, I feel that we need more of this in general. Uh, we, we absolutely need more of this and more collaborative spaces where information and tools and products and solutions can be shared and taken forward through multiple um, multiple players and 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 so on. Um, if I think about what we can do uh, as a provider ourselves is to, to use more sort of IVR and WhatsApp, as uh, Kaleo mentioned, in terms of giving information to customers. Those are quite widely used and very um, powerful tools um, in that sense. I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, ladies. And I think maybe the final question that we'll end on here today is, you know, drawing on what Babette had mentioned earlier about, you know, really this having a customer experience strategy and really looking at how we can begin to identify 
you know, support women consistently and continually to ensure that the products and services um, that we're coming up with really do meet their needs. So I think, again, maybe ending with that question. So for, for Flutterwave, for MFS Africa, and for Ping Money, if you had to focus on what would you say is the one thing that you all are really um, committed to doing or investing in over the next year in terms of really being able to build out that customer experience strategy that can really support the women customers that you intend to reach. I, again, Kalea, we'll start with you. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you, Aloma. So for Flutterwave, um, one of the things that we've actually been trying to work on is trying to create and build a very strong, a strong um, customer support department um, or what you should call also a contact center. And with specific to this, really identifying the different products, especially those that target women and uh, being able to create a platform where they can be able to share not just some of the, um, some of the challenges that they're having when accessing the, the platform, but also how can they pick up a phone call and um, be able to explain besides your financial literacy, what are other issues that you're experiencing and how do you redirect to the right um, partners or collaborators, uh, for instance, where you've got a lot of migrants that are moving from one country to another and they're facing all this uh, gender-based um, violence, how do we then create a platform that actually can be able to support um, these migrants, not just from being able to remit funds, but also being able to provide other areas of support for uh, that they experience when they move from one country to the other. Thanks, um, Kalia. And over to you, Sharon. Okay, um, so I'll talk about an initiative that we've done at MFS consistently for quite a few years now. Each time we launch um, a corridor, uh, or sometimes it's not even just launching a corridor, we always try to work with our MNO partners and actually go ourselves with our MNO partners and push them to go on the borders. We do this a lot in, in East Africa. Uh, we've just done this recently. Uh, in West Africa as well, go to the borders, try to talk to these migrants or people that are doing the remittances across borders, try to understand their pain points, try to understand how the MNO can improve, even if it's just from a pricing point of view, um, their experience, uh, how can we educate them more? Are they using illegal or informal channels uh, to say. So this is something that we actually do. So besides processing transactions for them, uh, we are always working with them, accompanying them, pushing them to say, hey, get to know uh, who are these people, especially around the borders where uh, we see a lot of those transactions and where people are still kind of using um, informal channels. Thanks, Sharon. And over to you, Babette. Thank you. So I would say for us, if it's the one thing, that we will commit to and need to commit to um, doing to su better support women and enhance their experience is to enhance our customer support offer and uh, looking at working closer with agents to make sure that they are able to give better support and information to customers as well, making sure that there is um, a, a, a unified sort of um, voice and, and support network um, that conveys and relays the same um, information and messages and support uh, across the board, really just strengthening um, that the, the customer support offer and experience. Um, I think that would be, if we're talking about one thing, that would be the one thing that we need to focus on first and foremost in getting it right. Thank you. Thank you, Babette. Um, and with that, um, the conversation is drawing to a close. 
And I'm going to challenge myself in one minute to just summarize um, a lot of the interesting and good points that have been raised here today. So I think if you walk away with anything from this conversation, um, we really did want everyone to understand the scope of migration um, within Africa, and indeed that over 50% of migration in Africa is interregional. So, you know, there's this idea that a lot of migration from Africa is from the south to the north, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, and that we see that while the pandemic has really driven that shift from informal to formal. A lot of women, uh, migrant women and women on the receiving end are still in the informal sector. And so they are experiencing challenges in terms of access, KYC, um, the disproportionate burden in transfer costs, and then issues with digital financial literacy. So that RSPs like the, the Flutter Waves, Ping Money, and MFS Africa will really have to think about how they can sustainably um, continue to innovate to ensure that they do reach this with these women and bring them into the formal financial sector. And I think one thing that really came out today was that there is a strong need for generating um, greater sex disaggregated data. And this is, again, one of the key things that UNCDF through our migration and remittances program is trying to do, because a lot of these new remittance offerings um, will, to be relevant, to be sustainable, to be efficient, will really have to be um, driven by evidence and by data. And, and again, lastly, that you know transfer costs within Africa are some of the the highest in the world. And so really the market does need to continue to evolve to see how um, we can work together to reduce this cost so that the migrants and the beneficiaries on the other end can be the ultimate benefits um, in the end. And so with that, I um, want to thank everyone for, for, especially our speakers, for participating in today's discussion. Um, the recording um, will be shared um, following this discussion. And for the questions that we were not able to, to get to, we'll send those to the relevant speakers and hopefully um, they should be able to respond to those um, in a timely manner. So again, with that, we'll move to close out today's discussion. Again, thank you all so much. Um, it was really um, an engaging and exciting discussion. So thank you. And with that, we'll close. Thank you. Bye, guys. <laughs> thank you.